animation to make something move. At its very core, animation is about telling a story, describe an object through the way it moves. You can use several different techniques in order to convey the properties of this object. And in this video, I hope that when you're done watching, you'll either figure out a way to make your already existing animations better by applying these fundamental theories to them, or get to work on your very new animations by already knowing them from the get-go. Hi there, by the way, I am Kevin, also known as Arts by Kev on the interwebs. And this video is aimed at literally anybody who works with animation for, for example, Minecraft at this point, so that you can make your animations better. In this document, I have a bunch of different animations here to decide, and I'm going to not only show you them, but also describe sort of the thought process behind them, how they apply to animation principles, but also give you an idea about exactly how closely related sound design and animation actually is. Because I come from the field of sound design, which many people might think is a bit weird, but that is actually the way that I got into animation in the first place. So let's step ahead and see what I got to show you. In order to sort of explain the different waveforms, I have decided to make this little model right here that has four different layers. And you can see that I have some keyframes down below. These four layers are going to show you sort of what the sound wave looks like, but also give you an idea about what follow through is, which we're going to talk about quite a fair bit in this video. So stick around for that, because follow through is one of the main principles for anything that should look realistic in any way, shape or form when you're animating. So if I start up this sine wave, we're going to see at the very middle here, I have a block that moves up. Then I have other blocks after that, the edges or the rings that is located around the center. You see the second and third and fourth ring. If I were to close off these three from your vision right now and go look at the center and then bring down the speed of this one to 50, you're going to see that we have an acceleration in the beginning. You see there? And then it has its peak speed in the middle and then it breaks as it's about to reach the top, then accelerates again on its way back. So this is a small sine curve motion. Because this is on just one dimension, it moves along the y-axis in this case. The sine does not look like a wave as we would normally think of a wave, which you would get if I apply the different motions right here. You can see this is the wave. But instead we get this just one dimensional movement. And that is what's really interesting about it. If we were to take a look at a different type of wave, we could take a look at the square wave. And the square wave is a bit different because a square shape is completely cut by the edge of the next event. So you have a maximum value and you have your bottom value. In the sine curve, it would accelerate from the bottom value to the maximum value by deaccelerating once it reaches the maximum value. In a square wave instead, we snap between the different values. So you go straight from the zero to the full value, and from the full value to the zero value. Going back to the sine wave again, if we want to add more expression to the things we're working on, which is super important also in animation, because expression tells more about your object or your entity or model or your creature or whatnot, compared to just making it move. Uh, with acceleration, in this case, I'm going to show you here, if I accelerate instead of deaccelerate on the sine wave until I reach the peak, and then deaccelerate from the peak instead of accelerating once again in order to go downwards, you get a more snappy move, like this one right here. I've decided to call it accelerated inverted sine wave. That makes no sense, so don't refer to that as that in any other situation. And then we also have the sawtooth wave, and the sawtooth is a bit interesting, and this is something that sound designers definitely would be used to seeing. A sawtooth is like a... If we take a look at a triangle, for example, this is a sawtooth shape. You've got the edge here, it follows along the, the line, and then at the top it has its peak. Then the sawtooth starts up once again because it's sharp. It's, it's like a combine of a square wave and a triangle. And that looks a bit like this. So it goes linear to the top and then it snaps back to the bottom. If I were to invert that, we would have a snap at the middle, which then linearly decreases. So linear increase with a snap decrease or a linear decrease with a snap increase. Now it's time to take a look at one of the most important reasons to why I made this video. I have seen so many animations recently where people seem to have no fundamental understanding for what follow through is about. So when you fail follow through, this is what you get. You get a motion that carries out with the same intensity 
from the get-go. Everything happens from the first frame. They don't understand that follow-through is about how weight and muscle mass is distributed differently throughout your body. It's as if there was a rope here that pulled through nooses along the edge of these blocks. And then when they were pulled, it would just grab them simultaneously. But follow through is not about making stuff simultaneously. It's about compensating for the time and duration when things would react. So if this would be applied in a follow through motion, what you would get instead, and in this case I'm using a sine wave to kind of tell my point, you would get something that looks a bit like this. This is a much more natural approach simply because things happen at their own time. They have a designated position within the timeline when they're supposed to happen. Now one may ask, is this super expressive? No, it's definitely not expressive, but this is a lot better than to do this for a dog's tail. Because if I saw somebody make a dog's tail that looks like this, I might question that a bit. But if I see someone that makes a dog's tail look like this, even of course I would like to have downwards movement as well, just the idea that it's smooth, that it has the segregation of the events makes it so much more interesting and also so much more alive. Now I'm going to show you an even more increased version of this and that is when you try to apply muscle mass and expression and I decided to call that one follow through sign muscle pull. So on the way down in this new animation I decided to add a bit of muscle mass that pulls the animation downwards and you're going to see what that looks like. So it has the slow increase but it also pulls back this is expressive. In this motion, you could feel anger, frustration, tensity. There is something more going on that describes the motion even further. Completely descriptionless, realistic, but not completely descriptional. This is maybe how something would potentially move in water if you wanted to do that. But this has intensity. It has expression. It has a purpose. It reasons with the viewer about why it's behaving in such a fashion. And it's also telling you something more about the rest of the object or the entity that this is connected to in such a way that you understand it further. Because motion is so important to how we fundamentally see the world around us. Continuing on the topic of follow through, let's go back to acceleration a bit. In this case, I am once again applying a sine wave motion. This is a half sine wave. It has the increase in acceleration and it has the decrease in acceleration. And when it reaches the top, it stops. So it's a half sine wave. Now, if I wanted this to be more expressive. I would remove the top of the sine wave, a bit like I did in the beginning when I showed you the wave shapes. And what I would also do is to apply some, well, in this case, I decided to call it a bump. And you'll see what I mean when I play this animation. It's very, very subtle. You might not even see it, but let's bring this down to 50. Did you see that it continued slightly further than we were supposed to stop? This is also a way of showing follow through in your motion because you're overstepping your current motion path. You know where you're supposed to go, but adding this little extra jank at the end gives a better idea of how the character that maybe holds a sword is trying to break that sword and bring it back to the position where they're supposed to have it. In general, this idea of making an animation end with a small increase to the motion before going back just lets the viewer understand the motion that goes into breaking that object. Like not breaking it as in destroying it, but breaking it as in breaking the acceleration. And then if we go even further, we can start apply one of the other things that I see many people still having to work a bit on, and that is scaling, which of course can only do in Bedrock Minecraft at this point if you're animating for Minecraft. And with squash and stretch, two of the absolutely most fundamental parts of animation practices, you get this type of motion. Let me play that in high speed for you. So Squash and stretch is a way to even further increase the expressiveness. This is very cartoony in a sense, but it increases the expressiveness of a block or a motion. If you have, for example, a sword, a way to squash and stretch that sword is maybe to increase the size of it when it goes through the most heavy part of the swing where all of the force is gathered in the blade. If you increase the scale of that sword through that motion, that sword is going to feel so much heavier and more impactful if it hits something on its way through. 
That is just one of the different examples for how to apply squash and stretch in order to make your animations more fluid. If we bring this down again to 50, if we play that from the beginning, you can see how I scale it down inwards and I stretch it. Remember this, squash and stretch is an animation principle that still forces you to keep a good eye on the volume of your object. So I can't break the volume of how big this cube is. So if I'm shrinking it, I also have to increase its height. Then in certain frames, I'm definitely stretching it. As you can see, I'm stretching, but also increasing or decreasing the overall size of it, the surrounding. And then up to the top, I of course come to that breaking point we spoke about before in the previous animation, where I squash it. So this is where all the force stops, and then it brings it back to its original shape. Take a look at that again. See? Full speed. Could even increase it to 200. Smack like that. You see how much that adds a difference. And this is, for example, how a water driplet, or yeah, if, if it were to come from the other way around. Now, this is going to be an upwards dripping water. How that would behave in its natural environment. Now, let's talk a bit about properties of an object. I may take a dragon, for example, just to make this example a bit clearer. On a dragon, if we broke the dragon apart in different pieces, the teeth, the bones, and the claws would all be considered high density. They are hard. They would not deform when you move them around with an animation, even if you wanted to try to make it expressive. However, the hand, the skin, the muscle areas around the body, they are soft and thus more keen to showing a different motion. And they would also apply more so into squash and stretch principles. Wings, for example, they have the other part about follow through when I spoke about the distribution of different events along the axis of an object. Inner, we would have the main muscle mass and the further out we got, the less muscle mass we would have affecting the object. Thus, we'll have to compensate for how much air we're forcing to push with the smaller muscle mass at the end, which is also a good reason to why wings in general, when they flap, they don't have so much motion going on on the end that actually adds extra weight or extra wing force. It's more so just there to catch the remainder of that that goes through. There's small muscle masses there that brings that together. But you could of course have different types of masses as well. In this case, let's talk about magnetic gravity. And this is when something more or less moves stuck on its surface. This is not very unusual to see, but this is also really good motion to keep in mind if you want to make a very heavy robot, for example, where it wouldn't necessarily move anywhere when the feet has impacted the ground. So I'm stuck here now. I am heavier than the ground. The ground is going to squash and stretch underneath my feet. I don't want to move any further. On the other hand, though, you might have something that is a bit bouncy, like this one, for example, when it falls down but it would, of course, react differently with the ground. Now, in this case, the surface underneath or the properties of this object is more bouncy. Thus, it would bounce. Mainly when we're working with different games, we might have a surface that we assign to be more bouncy to certain materials. And in this case, I would assume that this cube is the one that is the bouncy material and the surface underneath would be quite flat or hard. Then... We could, for example, take a look at the pudding. Then once again, I apply squash and stretch. This was also the cube that you saw in the beginning of this video. As you can see, it accelerates from the main pointer. If we bring that down to, let's say 30, we can take a good look at it. So it accelerates and then it comes to an impact and it lifts up because it's pudding, like it's sheer weight. The idea of it being brought up to the sides or being squashed would add new force on the way back. As you can see here, it goes down, but it also brings itself back up by forcing itself with the force of... <laughs> this is physics, so maybe I shouldn't go too much into that. But just imagine that the impact force that goes downward is now distributed to the sides in this cube. And when that can't go any further, it goes back to the middle and tries to shove it in another direction, thus applying the motion to the height of the object, which gives it the bounciness that then brings it up in the air before it goes back down and scales to its position. Let's bring that down uh, up to 100 again. So that is some over or yeah, extensive information, but also good to have in mind. And when we're talking about something that is bouncy in general, this is not necessarily how anything would bounce normally. Like it's very unlikely that this object would actually land on its surface like that, like fall straight flat. It's not very unusual, though, that I see this happen around. But one way to get around that is to try to make it land on one of the edges. Now, that may be for some people. If I just, as you see there, I'm leaning this object slightly with a new animation. 
Now I'm forcing myself to make this animation very much differently compared to the other one. This one would just fall flat down. This animation on the other hand is going to move slightly different. So if I play that, you can see there now it's bouncing on its edges. How am I calculating for that? How am I making sense with that? Well, this is more so on the physics side. This is when you're trying to make something look realistic once again. And you start thinking about how it would impact itself with the environment. And it's also very good to know this when you're working with uh, limbs like feet and hand on a, on a monster or something that is walking around in an environment that sometimes the hand may lean in a weird angle in order for it to maybe put some weight on the thumb for that next motion, which is going to look like that. Attack animations especially is a really good area to apply this skill in. So let's bring this down to 30. We'll take a good look at the bounce. As you can see here, what I'm essentially doing is that I'm applying new motion to the other side of the impact. So this is the first impact. Now this edge is on the ground. As you can see, it's lifted. Now I know this has to move in its opposite direction. So first only it didn't just tilt here. It would now have to tilt to the opposite. So it would have to tilt backwards, but it would also have to tilt to this side and more so more to this side than backwards because it's a smaller motion here and it's a bigger motion here. So I'm bringing it up, I'm tilting it very much to the descent, but only slightly backwards as you can see here. Now it's going to bounce up again, and once more I'm applying the most motion on this axis and some less here. I could have brought it forward though, but there is nothing that forces me to do that. Okay, I could think of this as a way for it to balance. It bounces on this peak right here, it could maybe continue or thumble over here, but it loses so much motion that it tries to thumble over on this edge right here, but it can't. So it goes back and now it would bounce on the upper corner, that corner up there, not the forward corner, as you can see. It tries to at least, but I managed to get both of the edges down and then brought into its position. So boom, 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 boom. Now, a more natural way of getting an impact of your object. So if we go through all of these, if you apply the different principles I've given you here in this video and try to just make your motions or your animations or, or all of this function in the ways that animation would actually be carried out to express, to explain, to inform the user, to inform the player of your game, how exactly this object behaves, what it's behavior is in terms of not only its properties but also how it would react to the world around it what expression it has what it means with the way it moves then your animation is going to look glorious in no time i hope you enjoyed the video and if you did leave a like and subscribe and i'll be around once again next time with something else to look at and that might be some bosses from the halloween map and if you haven't seen how i made the armored skeleton for halloween map you can check that out on this channel i leave a link down in the description but also here up on the screen to the left i think it is yeah probably the left so yeah take a look at that and take care till next time